Welcome everyone. My name is Isaac Theophilus. Welcome to the Outstanding Care Home Business Podcast. Today I have a very, very special guest and he is a very down-to-earth person, a care entrepreneur. I looked up the LinkedIn profile. The tagline is very humble in terms of what he has achieved so far. I felt this person should be writing a full story about his own journey as an entrepreneur in the care sector, but there is very little in there. We met at a break, business breakfast and we had a very lovely chat. And when I was able to dig deeper into who this real person is, I was so impressed because one of the interesting fact about this gentleman is, is the charisma of running a care home organization, which is down to earth, humble, and then anything that's coming out of his mouth is actually a golden nugget. So I was so curious to bring him on our podcast, and I hope you will enjoy the journey as well. Welcome, Mr. Tushar Shah. Thank you, Isaac. That's a lovely introduction. And you've set a very high standard for me on this podcast, but hopefully I can give a few golden nuggets to your listeners from this um, episode. Thank you very much. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And thank you for your time as well. Why don't you tell, tell me about yourself, a bit of background about you? Yeah, sure. So my name is Tusha. I'm a co-founder and co-director of Centrum Group. So Centrum Group is a family business and our care focus is really in the healthcare sector. So we run a domiciliary care service in the Berkshire area, which is part of the Bluebird Care Network. And we also run five care homes in Devon. And really, our philosophy is very much that when we start a business, we start a business where we can really make a difference, not just to our customers, but to our staff uh, and to the sector. When we're able to do that, we're actually able to then develop a business that is sustainable, innovative, and something that allows us to go to bed at night uh, in a calm and peaceful way, which I know for a lot of entrepreneurs is a big challenge. Yes. So you started off with as a graduation in law and then yes. you did a master's in business administration. Uh, let's go back a, a little bit further. When did you decide that you want to become an entrepreneur? So I think entrepreneur was always in our blood. So my father and his three brothers set up a, a family migrated from East Africa in the mm -hmm. 1970s. Mm -hmm. In Africa, they had a number of businesses and they came here and through hard work, determination, they started with a small shop, built it into a large supermarket. And my father set up the plastics manufacturing business, which he was doing back in East Africa. And together they worked and built the family business and they supported our homes, our education. So entrepreneurship was always within, was always within our DNA. But surprisingly, as you see with second and third generations, the bug for de going into business becomes less and less. But with my father, I had a very close relationship and we used to enjoy many conversations about business uh, and entrepreneurship. But after university, I always wanted to study law, always wanted to be a lawyer. But when I started working in there, I realized it was too restrictive for my creative energies. And so I looked to, to go into a different sector and I went into industry. I was very fortunate to get a, a graduate placement with Mars, the confectionery group. Yeah. And what many people don't realize is Mars is one of the large family businesses in the world. And not only do they make chocolates, they make pet food, food, electronics, and they've got a diverse range of businesses. And at that time, it was one of the fant one of the sort of like platinum graduate programs where many people that had gone on to that had become FTSE 100 directors, CEOs, etc., so I, I found that a really great training ground and it really worked for me because rather than saying you're going to be a finance person or you're going to be a sales person or you're going to be an operations manager, they put you on a graduate scheme in all of the different um, areas uh, and it gave you a flavor for what each part of a business did. And I really enjoyed that that diversity so early on in my career. And over time, I, I, I settled into commercial where I became responsible for our sales and marketing and heading up our relationship with our global advertising agencies. So for me, that was a fantastic experience. But more importantly, it was also seeing how a family business runs. And I still remember they had five values that was ingrained within the whole DNA business. 
and it was quality, efficiency, responsibility, mutuality, and freedom. And those five values, I've always taken those values and added that into all the businesses that we've done. Fantastic. That, that's a great story to hear where it all started. And coming from abroad, your parents making another success story in a new country. Would you say England is welcoming and there is always a ground for people who can start businesses without much restrictions? Would you say England is favorable in those certain kind of, like yeah. entrepreneurial things? I, I think so. I think this country... I think right now, when you look at the economic environment, it can be quite gloomy, it can be quite depressing. But there is a reason people want to come to the UK, mm -hmm. because we as a country are welcoming. It is a great place for business. Everyone, if you work hard, that you have an opportunity to move up the social ladder. I know in many countries that can be a challenge, but I think the UK does offer those opportunities. And also what I like about the UK is the diversity within the country. There is many communities, many languages, and everybody embraces that. And I think I know me, myself and my family have benefited by being in England, but I also feel that we've also contributed to the to the nation and feel very proud to be a British citizen. It's the same story for myself as well. First generation migrant myself, starting to change lives regardless of where I came from. And, and this uh, country is actually rewarding and very favorable in terms of uh, setting up the business. The only thing that I, I had to bring it myself is the hard work and dedication needed to get things done. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so that, that's the main thing. And I understand that you are also a mentor. You mentor young uh, entrepreneurs, startups and uh, you invest as well if it's the right opportunity. That's correct, yeah. I, I think as you go on this journey, when I look back, it was the conversations, both informal or formal, that's helped me get to where we are today in my journey. And I think giving back to those starting in that journey is very important. And, you know, I think one of my first businesses, I was a professional photographer and, and we focused uh, on high-end Asian weddings. And the only reason we did that was because I needed to pay the mortgage and the bills. So it's something I could do at the weekend while we're setting up a bluebird care. And I remember one conversation with a father of the bride who, who very similar had come to the UK, didn't have many assets, started off with a corner shop in Brixton. And he, he told me stories of how he had to use baseball bats to fend off anyone trying to steal from him and stuff oh. and the challenges and stuff. But from there, he developed a very successful business in his own right. And he said that when you're starting this journey, where you are now may not be where you want to be, but it's a stepping stone. And as long as you have a vision for your life, you'll always, and you work towards it with sincerity and the right values, you'll always achieve it. And the challenges you have are there to make you stronger and better for the next level in your journey. Thank you for sharing that. As an entrepreneur, when you talk about uh, challenges, what's the one challenge that that you have faced, you managed to overcome by growing your own personal skills and you, your own abilities? It when we start our business, our yeah. focus is, is in growing the business, growing the sales, growing the team, etc. But I think the biggest lesson I learned very early on in my journey was actually the biggest um, opportunity was to develop myself as an individual. If I was to become a better version of myself every day, this would then translate and manifest itself within to our business. And I think a prime um, example was this in 2008, where uh, we, we had global recession, banks had stopped lending, and all of a sudden, many care companies had gone, started going under. And Bluebird Care had we started taking a lot of these customers uh, and carers on, but we we felt we had a funding gap within our organization. And my my business partner, who's also my brother-in-law, Mehul, came up to me and said, Tushar, we've only got enough money to last a month within the business. Otherwise, we're going to have to close the business down. And it really freaked me out. And at that point, I said, what do we do? And I, somebody had always mentioned to me about Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I've got a credit card. But let's let's book these two tickets. Let's get out of the day to day and let's go away and get some energy, motivation, or inspiration. 
but actually that weekend and it's his it's his entry level which is a, a leash to power within mm-hmm. was actually transformational for both of us because it really said to us that actually we need to develop ourselves and it's not about having vision boards that that's all great but it's also about having the habits the discipline and the focus to work on yourself every day and that weekend really transformed me into there were many people on different journeys some people had very personal journeys some people had entrepreneurial journeys some people had other journeys that they had to go on but what we all learned was the way we approached it was our choice do we see the lessons that were in the challenges how could we be more positive and what could we do to help us on this journey and i think that weekend was very transformational for us and that that really started us on a personal development journey that every year we would always do something to make ourselves better to learn to become better to learn better and effectively also build our teams to become better um, servants for our business and our customers and i uh, understand that business is uh, rated outstanding by care quality commission and uh, it has been yes. running successfully now yeah i think in 2016 we got rated outstanding and again in 2018 it got rated outstanding so it's on been on two cqc inspections and i think it's something that when i look back at everything it's the one thing that i feel very proud of because it wasn't my it was actually a collective it was the team that got the outstanding and you can see the difference between an outstanding business to one that isn't and i think when you get it right you know you've got a business that really serves your purpose and your values fantastic uh, congratulations on that it's not easy to get outstanding especially for dom care uh, thank you when did your care home business journey started what made you come into care home sector so we started blue bed care in 2007 and then by two we started looking at other businesses and we for, for we started investing in property in 2011 so we did a couple of property courses and masterminds started investing in property and that grew very rapidly from 2011 to 2016 we had our ups and downs you know builders ripping us off deals falling through but we we really developed a very clear model that worked for us and around 2016 we felt okay this is really great we've got a great property business and we've got a great care business and back in 2006 one of our goals was actually to go into care homes the reason we went into blue bed care is we didn't have the funding mm-hmm. or the the resources to go into the care home sector so that's why we started blue bed care and then property so in 2016 we said okay we've done this for the last 5 years let's move into care homes so that's where we moved into care homes and it took us roughly 2 years to find our first care home in devon roughly 2 years uh, why yeah. was the delay So I think we'd actually agreed a deal in 2017 but unfortunately that fell through so then we went back to the market and I think always with the first deal that you have this was with investors so there's always a little bit of toing and froing making sure everybody's happy getting it right mm-hmm. and I think banks were also very much saying okay you've done dom care you've done property but care homes is a different sector it requires a different skill set so by the time we got everything lined up It, it was it took a while but effectively we agreed to deal in december 2017 we exchanged in january 2018 and finally once cqc registration came through we completed in may 2018 so there's always going to be delays in transactions but i think you know it was the right right thing for us at the right time yeah, one of the conversations that i enjoyed most with you when we met was your very good knowledge in seeking investments and how to speak to investors and how to get things done from that perspective what would you advise a person who doesn't own a care home or is an expert care home professional how can they jump into the ladder of owning a care home it's a capital rich asset business so they need to have a huge chunk of money in order to get into the sector what would you advise a person who is good outcomes in terms of as a healthcare professional but want to jump into the ownership ladder what what will take them there yeah so i think generally if you're a healthcare professional especially within the care sector i always find that people because in care we're always giving we never re- we never value our skill set and actually running a care home is a very complex business 
And the way I explain it to you is when you're running a care home as a manager, as a nominated individual, yes, you're running a care service, but you're also running a recruitment business. You're running a catering business. You're running a maintenance business. You're running a cleaning business. You're running an asset business, <laughs> asset management business. And you've got to wear all these different hats. And so somebody that has money needs to appreciate and value that. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking to investors, you need to show that if you're not getting all of these in working effectively, efficiently into the standards that you would expect and that they would expect, doesn't matter how much money you have, it's always going to fail because it's a very complicated business. But once it, well, it's not complicated, but if you don't have the experience, it becomes very complicated. And we mm -hmm. found that with our first care homes, we, although we had care experience, running a care home is a different skill set. So if you're a healthcare professional that definitely has that skill set, do not in any way undervalue yourself. That is a very valuable skill set. And when you're speaking to investors, you really need to ask them what's important to them. So the way I look at it is, is when you're looking at a marriage proposal, you, you're not going to, the first person you meet, you're not going to just marry them there and then. You're going to date them. So you're going to really get to know them, go out for a few di dinners, and then you have a couple of deep and meaningfuls. And this is where you start exploring. Well, what does this relationship look like? Well, where, what would they want this? Would they want one care home? Would they want to invest in three care homes, five care homes, 10 care homes? What is their appetite for it? What happens if they lose money or they have to put more money into the business? Asking these questions and not looking at the positives, but also looking at the negatives of running a care home sector. And does that still excite them? And if it does, then I think you found a partner that really you want to work with. Because generally, if the, if their if the responses value up, align with yourselves, then you know that when you have the challenging times, you're not going to be focused on trying to turn a business around as well as managing investor fear and anxiety. You're actually going to work together to resolve it because you know that in the long run, over a five-year period, things will I things will sort of normalize and you'll actually get real success and real returns whilst doing a, delivering a fantastic service to your residents and looking after your staff. That's an amazing tip. And reflecting on my own journey, although I was heavily experienced in the sector and I consulted uh, so many care home businesses, I managed to turn around a lot of care homes. I didn't, I didn't value the skill set to the level to speak to an investor jump on board and let's do this together i didn't i think one of the biggest barrier for myself was not realizing how much i was capable in myself in running a care home business i think once i understood that the journey was a lot easier and i even managed to pull up a care home myself now which is which is amazing so thank you for that great tip i think anybody who is listening who has got the skill set the first thing is uh, believing in your own abilities like you said care home operation it's running multiple business in one under one roof if you are an expert in that no, none of the investors can undervalue that expertise so that's a good starting point isn't it and and yes, I, I would yes. love to have more health professionals owning care home business because that would definitely increase the quality of care in the care sector yeah and Fantastic. i think sometimes if you have if you have that skill set and that value and that is an aspiration sometimes it's having that conversation with your directors or the owners of your homes because i think now if i look in this sector there are many people in their 60s and 70s yep. that own care homes yep and they are looking for a, a retirement exit yep and sometimes if you've been loyal and they trust you and they have that relationship they will be open to looking at ways of structuring their exit that works for them and may potentially work for you. Fantastic. That's a great tip. And and most care home providers would love to want to give their care home to people who they trust. And they want to make sure that the staff are looked after. It's not a corporate buy. There's some ethos and values to continue and the operations remains the same. So asking that question to the director itself, and if they identify the value in them, yes, they would definitely invest and give a helping hand. Uh, yeah, fantastic. 
So thank you so much for that tip. And I know you are a very passionate technology, very passionate about technology. On In our conversation, you had shown me so many softwares that I have never heard of. <laughs> and, yeah. and how do you keep up with the technology? What, why did you have this taste of technology yourself? So I think it's always been there. And I think when I look back at, somebody asked me this question, what's your, what would you say is one of your biggest strengths or your biggest gifts? And I think one of me is seeing things before other people, before it becomes mainstream. So it's what I would call early adopters. So you get the early adopters, the innovators, then the acceptance, and then the, the laggers. And I'm very much at the early adopters. So I see the potential in things way before many people see that. So that can be a strength, but it can also be a weakness because with the early adopters, you also have to be ruthless because some things will not work <laughs> and some things will work. And so for me, I always saw that. But one of the things that I found with technology is when used correctly, it can really reduce the burden and inefficiencies in your business and allow your team and your staff to really do what they want to do, which is to deliver good quality care and run an outstanding service. So for me, now, technology, I love technology, but I'll only use technology if it's going to make a real difference to our staff and our team. And I'll also say to my team, if it's not working well, tell me, because I understand that sometimes it can overwhelm people. There is a lot of uh, paperwork in the sector and that we do need to keep on top of a number of things. And to put that into one person's brain, I think you would need to be a supercomputer. Um, so using technology to reduce that burden and allow people to focus on what needs to be done next or in the next week is a very powerful way to allowing them to have sanity, but also demonstrate that they're delivering a good, if not outstanding service. So for me, technology is a foundation that will enable you to run a good to outstanding service. And it's thank you. And it's very disruptive as well. And looking next 10 years time. Uh, or do you have any predictions on how things will change for care home sector? So I think the, it's, the care sector is always going to be a people business mm -hmm. because we're looking up to people. But I do see things changing. So I think AI will mean that care plans will be more person-centered, mm -hmm. will be able to be more responsive if we embrace it properly. So it will notify that actually, you know, Mary has a, had a bowel movement for two days. This would be we may need to speak to a health professional to get advice, or we may see that somebody's weight is declining. Therefore, we need to review, get a dietitian in to review their diet, etc. So I think AI will be very, one, in writing the care plans, but also monitoring the data to give us indications that somebody may need a bit more further support or a different approach to their care. I do think I think robotics will also play a part in this. Mm -hmm. I think especially for things that you're already seeing. I, I was reading an article at the Singapore hospital and they've got robots there giving drinks out, recording what drinks are being done, doing the cleaning, dispensing medication, et cetera. So I think that is going to be something that is going to be happening. But I think care homes also have to have the right infrastructure in order for that to do, because obviously getting upstairs or, different levels is going to be a bit of a challenge uh, but I do think that will be a massive opportunity but I also think that technology we still got it we're still in the business of looking after people and that human connection needs to be there and I think if we use it right it will mean that our staff can actually spend more connected time with our residents doing the things that right now that they're struggling with cleaning or medication or hoisting all the things that needs to be done, but actually takes a lot of time to do. And technology could enable to reduce that burden and actually focus more on the residents and the one-to-one -one time. I'm looking forward for it. When you say somebody is at risk of uh, malnutrition, somebody is at risk of a uh, fall, if the AI can uh, highlight that risk uh, very quickly, well early on, uh, we can actually prevent a lot of health uh, problems going to hospitals or ending up in having a fall, which can be life-threatening for these residents. So how we are going to adapt to all these changes is going to be interesting to see in the next 10 years. What's your favorite software? The one that makes my life easier. <laughs> yes. Um, can you recommend? So, so I think 
on a personal level, the one thing that I really enjoyed this year is my Re Remarkable tablet. So Remarkable is a very black and white tablet that lets you write notes uh, and read PDFs. And I find that as a personal, when I've got different hats, different businesses, having one notebook, which has many notebooks within it, a game changer for me. And because all it is is for note taking, it's very, really great. And it actually feels as if I'm writing with pen and paper. So I think that for me is the best one. Personally, from a business perspective, technology is just changing all the time. And I, I, I wouldn't want to say something now because I think in six months time, it would be very different. But I think it's the one that hits your values. So is it making you, allowing you to deliver more care, better care to your residents, mm -hmm. uh, better support to your employees? and actually reducing inefficiencies in your organization. If it's hitting those criteria, that is my best software. So I think a lot of the care planning software is very good. A lot of the human resource software is also very good because we, you know, first thing as a registered manager, making sure you're recruiting staff, DBS references, having all of that in one electronic place running reports is gonna be a game changer for you as opposed to having files and then manually having to go in and see, is a DBS valid or is it expired IDs, et cetera. So I think those kind of softwares are very good and very powerful. Fantastic. Thank, thank you for recommending Remarkable. I think I have come across it. So personal level, I know you do a, a lot of charity work. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your charity work? What do yeah, you so, yeah, so I think from a very young age, charity has always been giving back. So I love doing looking at opportunities to give back to our local community and to charities abroad. So one of the things that I do is I, I work as an organisation that runs local youth clubs across the country. And that's very good because I think the younger generation are our future generation. And, and if we can invest in them, give them the opportunity. Right now, that generation has so many opportunities mm -hmm. that actually it can overwhelm them. I find when I was young, we didn't have those many opportunities, whereas I think this next generation has too many opportunities and that can overwhelm them. And it's saying to them, actually, look, right now, it doesn't really matter. So working with young, young people, mentoring them, supporting them and developing young leaders is something that I'm very passionate about. The other thing is, is setting up, you know, we, we, we're supporting and setting up schools in India. Recently, we helped set up a, a, a home for those with learning disabilities outside oh. Mumbai. Um, and that's something that we're very passionate about uh, and we want to contribute more. Last year, I, I did a number of events uh, from uh, running the London Marathon, doing the three peaks, doing a hundred kilometer trek in Lake District. Unfortunately, I was meant to go to every space camp, but unfortunately, my father was end of life. So I was I have to postpone that till this next year. But part of that was then to raise funds to build a school in Nepal for orphan children. So I think for me, giving back to those communities is very important because I think education is the key to allowing a better world. And I think the more opportunities we can give children to have a better education, the better the world will become. Yeah, absolutely. Agree to that. 100% agree. And hats off to you for doing all this amazing work. And I can understand how much difference it would make for uh, people in India with learning disabilities. Uh, very not very well looked after in those kind of areas and 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 again m mentoring people who wants to be the future leaders uh, when they get the right mentorship from the right person that's going to open up their doors uh, wide open for their opportunities in that long game i myself have been uh, i would say i am a product of so many mentors so so many people have helped me over the period of time helping me to think in the right direction and I'm very thankful to all of them. And I'm while speaking to you now and the meetings that we had, I learned quite a lot. And that's why I thought you need to be heard more in the sector. Rapid fire round, few questions, care home or dorm care? What do you prefer? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I prefer both. both. Uh, I think both, th there is a real need for it. And for me, it's not about the sector, it's about, does it fit my values? And if I can deliver a good service that fits my values, then you'll have my 100% support. Mm -hmm. And I think both are necessary because people do need to stay in their home as long as possible, um, but they will come to a time where they need a more intense care and care homes can definitely provide that. 
but also isolation is the biggest challenge for many people. And domiciliary care does provide some of that, but sometimes if you're a very person that needs to be around people, care homes can be a fantastic environment for them. Thank you. Are you political or non-political? I am political. <laughs> Favorite food? Oh, I've got to say Indian food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And who was your inspiring leader? I think it's got to be my dad. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. And he passed away. Yeah, he passed away 1st of November this year. And I think for me, it was, he was very humble. Yeah. He achieved so much in such a short space of time. And he always gave. Mm -hmm. Nothing was too trouble. And he was very humble. And I think that for me was why I inspired me a lot. And I think he was very proud of everything I've gone on to do. Mm -hmm. And I think he doesn't realize how much he's helped me on that journey. Yeah. Where can people find you or how can people reach out to you for mentorship, advice, opportunities? I think the best way is probably through LinkedIn. Message me. So really for me, the mentorship I do is there to is there to help, not to help them, but also to help the people. So I use those funds to support the activities that we do for charities. So for me, it's if I have the time and it, we're a right fit, then I definitely would lo love to work with people. But I think, you know, I'm always there to give advice. And if it's a very quick answer, I'll definitely give that advice free of charge. Yeah. Fantastic. So LinkedIn is the best place to yeah. reach out to you. Fantastic. Yeah. It's been a great pleasure meeting you several times and also online as well now. And I feel like many entrepreneurs will find your the, the conversation with you very inspirational and also very helping to think in the right direction in their entrepreneurial journey as well. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you for having me on this podcast. Thank you. And wish you good luck for all your future ventures, charity and care home business and dom gear business. I'm sure you're, you'll be a great entrepreneur making difference to a lot of people's life. My best Thank you. Thank you so right. much. Thank no you. Worries.